Now am I audible? Oh. Okay. All right. Yeah. So last, uh, the week before last, we started off with doctrine of the word of God. We looked mainly at the formation of the Old Testament canon and the formation of the New Testament canon. Um, today we will focus more on one aspect of the doctrine of the word of God, something that is called inerrancy. That's the term that is used. Uh, it basically talks about how the Bible is accurate, where there are no defects or errors in the Bible. That is the that is basically what uh, we would be talking about. So um, people who talk about the accuracy of the Bible, they use two terms, infallibility and inerrancy. So it's kind of good for us to know what those two terms mean when we use them with regard to the Bible. So when they say that the Bible is infallible, they basically are saying that the Bible is trustworthy. It's reliable in all the details that it is providing. There's nothing false or wrong in the word of God. So infallibility of the Bible uh, mainly talks about how the Bible is a trustworthy manuscript. Um, we have verses, of course, you know, which talk about the infallibility of scripture. Uh, so maybe we could have one person read out for us. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. Second Peter 1, 19 to 21, please. Either here or on, I mean, online, if someone could read out. Second Peter 1, 19 to 21 which talks about the infallibility of the Bible. Can I read, sister? Former sin. You will do well to pay close attention to it, as to a lamp shining in a dismal place, until the day breaks through and the morning star rises in your hearts. First, understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is of any personal or private or special interpretation for no prophecy over ever originated because some man willing willed it but men spoke from god who were born along by the holy spirit uh in the niv the very first portion you know verse 19 it says the prophetic message is something completely reliable that's the term that is used I could not quite catch the term that was used uh, in this translation. Uh, but yeah, you know, so it, it basically talks about how the uh, prophetic message which is given in the uh, Bible is completely reliable. And then in verse 21, it goes on to say that human beings didn't write whatever they wanted according to their human will. Rather, they wrote even as God spoke to them and they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So because God is trustworthy, because there is nothing false in God, we can therefore be confident that the message which he conveyed in the word of God is also trustworthy and has no fault in it. Let's look at another scripture um, which talks about from where this word of God has come, you know, how it has come directly from the Lord. So that would be 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Uh, if we could have someone read out for us, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. All scriptures is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Yes. If we were to look at that original word that is used, you know, in the Greek, it literally says all scripture is God breathed. It God himself has breathed out that word. Now, what does that mean? Um, uh, you know, uh, maybe if we were to look at 1 Corinthians 2.13, that would give us an idea of what exactly that term God breathed 
means. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. These things we also speak, not in words, by which man's wisdom teaches, but to which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And so when in 2 Corinthians 3.16, it's talking about how God's uh, scripture is completely God-breathed. It's talking about how the Holy Spirit is the one who's providing the words, you know, which uh, are taught. Uh, he, uh, he helps the writer to express spiritual realities using spirit-taught words. Of course, last time we saw that it was it's not direct dictation word by word, but the Holy Spirit gives the principles, the spiritual truths which need to be conveyed, and then the writer puts it in his own human vocabulary. Uh, so in this sense, all scripture is God-breathed, and therefore it is accurate and it is trustworthy. So in this sense, uh, the Bible is infallible. And so for uh, quite a few generations, uh, right up to the early 1900s, this is basically the belief that was held regarding scripture, that the Bible is um, infallible. It is trustworthy. It has no defects. And then in the early 1900s, uh, people began to say that you know, in the early 1900s is when there was a lot of scientific uh, discoveries made. Uh, there was an industrial revolution taking place. Uh, people began to feel very confident about themselves because they're making so many strides in technology and their lifestyle is improving. So now they did not feel the uh, respect and the dependence on God, which they earlier had. And so you had a lot of people, intellectuals, in the 19, early 1900s, who began to question the Bible. And so then they would say, see, we are making so many advances in science. And when we look at this Bible, this Bible is filled with all kinds of wrong scientific facts. So they began to say, this Bible is um, not completely infallible. Um, uh, there are Maybe it is reliable as far as doctrine is concerned. But when it comes to scientific facts, when it comes to historical details, there are defects in this Bible is what they began to say. And uh, you know this was a very dangerous direction in which uh, these people were heading. And uh, so it was finally in 1978 that a lot of Christian leaders came together and they made a formal declaration. Uh, so in 1978, uh, there were, you know, evangelical theologians and pastors and uh, biblical scholars and, and a lot of lay Christians who wanted to be involved in this. They all came together. They had long discussions. And um, at the end of it, they issued a public declaration. It's something that's called the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. According to the statement, they declared there are no errors in the Bible. Yes, there are no errors when it comes to doctrinal matters. Everything written in the Bible, all the doctrine given in the Bible is accurate. But even when it comes to uh, you know, historical facts, even when it comes to the mention of scientific details, the Bible is accurate even in those things. So which basically means there are absolutely no errors in the Bible. So that was the declaration which they uh, made. Uh, you know, they used various verses to back up what they are saying. Maybe we can just look at one single verse. Uh, Psalm chapter 12, verse 6. Psalm 12, verse 6. The words and promises of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined an earthen furnace purified seven times over. It says here that the words of the Lord are so refined and so pure, it's like gold which has been refined seven times in the fire. You know, it's the, the word of the Lord is that pure. It is that flawless. There are no defects in it. And so 
these people who came together in 1978 made a declaration and they said the bible is accurate regarding doctrine but the bible is also accurate when it comes to historical details it is also accurate when it comes to scientific uh, uh, things which are mentioned now in your textbook you know that uh, that little small manual that has been given to you uh, the apc manual in that you will see this particular definition for that word inerrancy this is basically what your textbook says inerrancy of scripture means that the scripture in the original manuscripts do not affirm anything that is contradictory to fact it's a very good definition actually uh, what you know the one that's given in your textbook it says that um, the scripture it does not affirm anything that is contradictory to fact which means everything in the bible is factual when it comes to facts it is correct in its presentation of facts uh, so this being the case how do we deal with the arguments which people raise which critics raise you know skeptics uh, the the things which they say they say oh the bible is full of defects and they make certain points they raise certain examples and they say look look at this example the bible is defective over here and they point to another passage and they say ah look at the way this passage is you know uh, talking about this particular issue this bible is defective so how do we deal with arguments like that so we believe that the bible is infallible it's completely trustworthy it will never let us down and we believe that the bible is inerrant there are absolutely no errors of any kind in the bible um now if you were to look at that um you know the definition in your textbook it says the inerrancy of scripture uh, is in the original manuscript so the original manuscript which was first written down by moses the original letter which was first written down by paul when he wrote to the galatians that original manuscript did not contain any errors of def or defects so we need to kind of you know hold that in our minds that the original manuscript which was first put down on paper when uh, the writer was led by the holy spirit to you know express spiritual truths in um, a, using spiritual using spirit taught words at that point of time there were no errors in the scripture now after that i mean as they didn't have xerox machines in those days someone had to make hand copies so they would take the original um, manuscript someone would sit down and try to make a 100 copies of the original and then other people would take those 100 copies and then they would sit down and make more copies so that these hand written copies can be sent from church to church throughout the you know region of asia minor so when that was going on sometimes these people who are doing the copying they made mistakes spelling mistakes sometimes they would forget to mention a, uh, an alphabet you know that sometimes they would uh, um, add an extra alphabet so things like that happened later but in the original manuscript there were no errors because they wrote as they were led by the holy spirit okay so we need to keep that in mind now coming to these uh, arguments which people raise against the bible uh, we will look at maybe three types of criticisms that are generally uh, you know uh, directed against the bible the first is regarding historical facts they say that when it comes to historical facts the bible is defective now uh, you know especially in our current age it's mainly the um, you know the muslim scholars who are targeting the uh, church and the bible a lot i know in re with regard to these uh, things so they say when it comes to historical facts uh the bible is not very accurate um you know and um, the main argument that we can present for this is that based on the current historical evidence that is available to us we still don't know all the facts so based on the current evidence it may look like something written in the bible is wrong 
but once we discover a little more of the ancient history we will find we will realize that whatever is recorded in the bible is accurate because right now we do not know everything about ancient history we do not know the names of all the places the names of all the leaders in the different places there are many things which we still do not know so as new evidence comes to light it will be confirmed very very clearly that what is mentioned in the bible regarding certain historical facts is correct it uh, and this has happened in many cases um, we'll just look at a couple of examples because you know we have so much to cover and there's no time um, if we could have someone read out for us luke chapter 3 verse 1 luke chapter 3 verse 1 Luke chapter 3 verse 1 Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea Herod being tetrarch tetrarch of Galilee his brother Philip was tetrarch of Iturea and the region of Tracodes and Listen, listen here, Stratrak of Evelyn. Okay, a lot of historical details packed into this one single verse. So, you know, Luke is trying to tell us exactly at which historical time these, uh, you know, events took place. So he very specifically says in the 15th year of the rule of Tiberius, in that 15th year, when these were the main leaders in Judea, you, have, you basically had Pilate as the governor. If you were to look at Galilee, Herod was the tetrarch over there. If you look at uh, Ituria and Triconitus, then over there the tetrarch is Philip. And he also says that in a place called Abilene, the tetrarch in that particular place is Lysanias. So um, for a long time, I mean, uh, people have known that these historical facts are accurate, except for this last bit. where it talks about Lysanias being the tetrarch of Abilene now the historical records which were available to the people to the scholars all of those historical records talked about a Lysanias who was actually a ruler of another place called Chalcis half a century earlier that man was nowhere around in the 15th year of Tiberius and so critics began to say look this is a mistake Lysanias was not the tetrarch of Abilene in the time of Tiberius in fact he was a ruler half a century earlier in a different place altogether in in a place called Chalcis and so criticism was you know uh, being heaped against the bible but then um um a new inscription was discovered from the time of Tiberius archaeologists found a new inscription and once they found that inscription you know on that carving which has been um, you know carved onto a stone on that stone inscription very clearly the words are written that lysanias is the tetrarch in abila okay so it's just a variant of abilene so it says clearly that lysanias was the tetrarch in abila near damascus which is exactly the place which you know luke was talking about and so now that the stone inscription was discovered it was proved that the historical fact given in the bible is accurate so the reason that people think that certain historical um, details are wrong in the bible it's only because archaeologists have not yet found details regarding the ancient history of you know previous times as and when new discoveries are made it will be proved that the bible is very accurate in all of its historical details uh, to use another example um, you know in john chapter 5 verses 1 to 15 that's basically where you have the story of the uh, of the paralytic who was lying down you know next to the pool of bethesda and over there when uh, john is describing that pool of bethesda this is basically what he says uh, john chapter 5 verse 2 if we could have someone read out john chapter 5 Verse two. Now there is in Jerusalem a pool near the sheep field. This pool in the Hebrew is called Bethsaida, having five porches. 
Exactly. So it says that this pool was surrounded by five porches. There are five porticos on five different sides, you know, where people can, you know, uh, uh, lie down and uh, you know where the sick can be taken care of. So there are five porches, is what John said. And there was a lot of criticism regarding that because they said we have not found any such pool anywhere in this region where uh, you, you have a pool with five porches. And then, of course, again, archaeologists, they made a discovery about 40 feet under the ground when they were digging in a certain place, uh, you know, near the sheep gate. They discovered this pool and exactly as told, there were five porches around it. So not only is the Bible accurate when it comes to doctrine, it is also accurate when it comes to historical details. Now, what do we say regarding scientific facts? I mean, especially because we have, you know, evolutionists now declaring that there was, there was, there was never any creation event. Rather, you just had the uh, world evolving as time went by. So what do we say regarding scientific facts? Um, Let's look at one example, Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse five. And if you, you know, if you were to just read Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse five, you would say, oh yes, this is definitely scientifically wrong. Okay, let's read Ecclesiastes one, verse five. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. Okay, so here it says very clearly that the sun rises and the sun sets. And now that we have, you know, satellites in outer space, now that we have actually have, have people who have gone to outer space, we are all very much aware that the sun doesn't run around anywhere. It just stays in one fixed position. So the sun does not rise. It does not set. It does not hasten back to the place from where it came. We know that. So would we say that this is an error, that there is a scientific error in the Bible? Not necessarily, because when God was talked about, when God touched upon scientific things, he always used human language. He used human thought forms, which the people of that particular time would understand. You know, if it in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 5, you know, if, uh, if God had said, you know, uh, every day the earth rotates around its axis, they would not even understand what God is saying. What on earth is this about earth rotating? Because they don't feel any rotation happening. And they would wonder, oh, does the earth have an axis? You know, they, it would not even make sense to them because God would be talking about some scientific facts which are way beyond their understanding. As human beings living in that particular time, what did they see with their physical eyes? They didn't even have telescopes at that time. And of course, they had no satellites. So in their limited um, you know, um, knowledge of that time, what did they see in the, with their physical eyes? Every day they would see the sun moving from east to west. They would see the moon moving from east to west. In the night, the stars are also moving from east to west. That's basically what they're seeing with their physical eyes. And so in their thinking, this was the thought form in their mind, that the sun, it moves. And that the stars, they move. That was their worldview. That was their perspective. And so God is not interested in de delivering a science lesson. He's trying to make a point. You know, in the book of Ecclesiastes, the writer is inspired by the Holy Spirit to talk about how uh, everything that has ha that is happening in the world has been happening since generations. Nothing new is, is taking place. The sun has always behaved in a particular way, and now it's continuing to behave in that particular way. And God wants to go on and talk about other things. He doesn't want to stop at that verse and give a long, you know, uh, deliver a long lecture on the earth and the solar system and things like that. Because it would be irrelevant for the audience at that time. He's, God wants to impart a spiritual lesson to them, not give a scientific lesson to them. And so in the Bible, there isn't too much detail about scientific things. God just touches upon certain details using words which the people of that time would understand and he moves on because for him the emphasis is not on delivering a science lecture the emphasis is on imparting some spiritual truth which will benefit those people and so um, from the human viewpoint from the viewpoint of the observers human observers at that time yes it certainly would have looked like the sun is you know rising and the sun is setting each day 
Okay, so we need to uh, to look at all the scientific wording used in the Bible in terms of the culture of that time. What would the people of that time have understood? Um, let's look at another uh, example, and I think this is something that we should um, uh, touch upon because this verse is sometimes wrongly interpreted. Um, Isaiah 40, verse 22. Isaiah 40, verse 22. It is God who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. It is He who stretches out the heavens like curtains and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. It's talking about the awesomeness of God, the sovereignty of God. And uh, so the phrase which is used over there, it says, He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. Now, many Christians take that phrase very wrongly and they say, ah, see in the Bible it states that the earth was spherical, you know, it was a sphere, like a ball. No, that's simply not the Hebrew word being used over there. The Hebrew word that is used over there is the Hebrew word called kug. Now that word kug is either referring to a flat, round object like a dinner plate, you know, a flat object, or it, the word kug can also refer to a bowl which is turned upside down, so it's like a dome. So the word kook was basically used for these two things, either a flat circular object or a dome, you know, uh, like an overturned cup. So it could be, uh, it, 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 it was used in that sense. So in this scripture, uh, basically Isaiah is writing and saying that God sits on top of this circle. It's in no way saying that uh, that word is referring to the earth being shaped like a ball, being shaped like a sphere. That's simply not the term that is used over there. So, horizon. because it's like a dome, right? The horizon is like a dome. From the human observer's viewpoint, when he looks, he thinks that there is a dome covering the uh, surface of the earth. True. So, in that sense, that word kug was used. So, it is, we should be careful not to misinterpret scriptures based on our modern understanding of science. Okay, so it can go either way. We can either take a scripture and say, ha, see, the, the, this, is, uh, this scripture is saying complete, something completely wrong regarding science. Or we can go to the other extreme and try to forcibly manipulate those verses to line up with scientific uh, facts today. Either thing doesn't really help. You know, so um, it's good to understand what those terms meant in those times, in that culture, and just stick to the understanding at that level. Yeah, go ahead. You have a question. Uh, that Hebrew word kug, it basically meant two things. It can refer to a flat circular object, like a chapati, or like a, like a plate, a flat so when they would say kug, they can be maybe they're talking about a flat object. So in that case, they are saying that the earth is like a flat chapati, and then you know you have gods enthroned above that. On the other hand, the word kug can also refer to a dome. Um, when you're standing in an open space and you and you're able to look way ahead, you you can see the you know the dome-shaped uh, horizon, you know where the sun is rising or the sun is setting. It looks like, you know like a dome. So the word kook could also refer to a, like an, it's like an overturned cup, an upside down cup, a dome. So when they used the term kook, they were referring to that. They were not referring to a spherical ball shaped object at all. They were not even aware that the earth was spherical at that time. So when it comes to scientific facts, we need to understand that God just used human thought forms human language based on what the people were familiar at that time because his main goal was not to give a science lecture. The main goal was just to impart a spiritual truth and he just touches upon that scientific um, fact in that sentence very briefly. And so, you know, we cannot take those verses and you know, um, try to derive entire scientific, um, you know, 
explanations out of that. That would be a wrong way of looking at these scriptures. Uh, another allegation that is made regarding the Bible uh, is regarding Bible passages. They say, oh, look, this passage is contradicting this passage. Or that verse is saying this. On the other hand, the other verse is saying something else. And so they say there are contradictions in the Bible passages. One example that's, uh, that a lot of critics use is um, Exodus, Exodus 20, verse 5. Yeah, so if you could have someone read out for us, Exodus 20, verse 5. You shall not bow down yourselves to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Now, um, in our modern times, we have a very wrong understanding of this verse. We seem to think that God is saying over here that he will you know, the wording over there, it says punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. It sounds to us as if God is going to punish innocent children just because the parents were sinful. Okay, but if you look at the Old Testament uh, prophets, they understood this particular verse correctly. They had a very correct perspective of this verse. So those who misunderstand this Exodus 25, they say, look, Exodus 25 seems to be indicating that God will punish the children if the parents are sinful. And they say, there's another verse which contradicts this verse. And they refer to Ezekiel 18, verse 20. If we were to, uh, if someone could read out for us, Ezekiel 18, verse 20. The soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear and be punished for the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear and be punished for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him only, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon the wicked only. So critics and skeptics, what they say is, look, in Exodus 25, God is saying, uh, that uh, he will punish the innocent children because the parents were sinful. On the other hand, in Ezekiel 18.20, God says, no, 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 children will not be punished for the guilt of their parents. So they say, look, the Bible is full of defects. God is not able to make up his mind. When one place he says one thing, in another place he says another thing. But this misunderstanding has risen because the people have wrongly interpreted scripture. So in this third category of criticisms which are raised, where they say that one passage is contradicting another passage, they think that there's a, there's a contradiction because they have misinterpreted the scripture. So let's look at Jer Jer Jeremiah chapter 32, verse, verses 18 and 19, where Jeremiah is referring to the Exodus 25 uh, verse. And this is the way he interprets this particular verse. Jeremiah 32, 18-19. You who show loving kindness to thousands, but recompense the iniquity of the fathers into the bosoms of the children after them. The great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. Great in counsel and mighty in deeds, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men to reward or repay each one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Jeremiah has understood Exodus 25 very clearly. He says, Lord, your eyes are open and you're looking at the ways of all mankind. You're the God who rewards each person according to their conduct. So when he's talking about Exodus 25, he is clearly interpreting it in the sense that God will only punish those who are doing wickedness. The problem with the wrong interpretation of Exodus 25, uh, 20 verse 5 is that we don't understand the context in which it was given. Now, if you remember Exodus chapter 20 and in fact all the other um, you know, uh, chapters uh, over there are 
spoken by God at Mount Sinai. These people are now starting off on their new journey. And uh, God is making a covenant with them. And so at that time in Exodus 20 verse 5 at Mount Sinai, this is the warning which God gives them and he says, you know what, I am a jealous God. So if you continue in your sinfulness, in the sins of your parents, you will be punished. This is what the Lord says, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. So just because I have delivered you in a grand and miraculous manner and brought you out here, don't assume that you can just get away with your sinful lifestyle. If you go back to the sins of your parents, the punishment will come even upon you, even to the third and the fourth generation. I will not spare anyone who is living in sin. That is the you know wording which God is using over here. So in Jeremiah 32, when uh, you know Jeremiah is sitting over there thinking about the destruction of Jerusalem, which is imminent, you know he's thinking and he says, "Yes, Lord, you are just in your ways. You told us already in Exodus 25 that if we continue to walk in the sins of our parents." This is what would happen to us. And yes, that is what we see. So if you look at the entire Jeremiah chapter 32, the entire chapter. So in, you know, in uh, 30, Jeremiah 32 verse 24, he goes on to say, see how the siege uh, ramps are built up to take the city. Because of the sword, famine and plague, the city will be given into the hands of the Babylonians. Um, and he ends, you know, with the verse 24 with these words, Jeremiah 32, 24, he says, what you said, has happened as you now see. So in, if you look at that entire chapter as one long passage, we understand that Jeremiah clearly understood Exodus 25, where God said, if the children walk in the sins of their parents, yes, they too will be punished. They will not be spared. And so Jeremiah says, yes, Lord, exactly as you have said, it has happened. And in fact, he praises God in verse you know, um, 19. And he says, great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Because he understands that God is fair. God is just. So if the children are living in sin, if the children are following the sins of their parents, they too must be punished. Why does God you know, say these words in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5? Because their parents had been happily living in sin in Egypt. You know, they were not exactly saints over there when they were living in Egypt. I mean, in fact, we, we saw that when we were covering the Old Testament, right? Um, Joshua chapter 24, verse 14, where it very where Joshua very clearly says, Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. When the people were living in Egypt, they were living in idol worship rather than following the true God. And so in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, God says to them very clearly, if the children continue to walk in the sins of the parents, they will be punished. They will not be spared. And uh, so uh, when we, uh, which is why in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, God again clearly restates and says, the child will never share the guilt of the parent. Each person will be judged for whatever they have done. So there is absolutely no contradiction between Exodus 25 and Ezekiel 18.20. Those who misinterpret scripture wrongly think that there is a contradiction. Once we understand the correct interpretation of these scriptures, we see that there are no contradictions. Another um, criticism that is raised, I'm just picking on some very popular arguments that are raised against the Bible because we have no time to go through all of it. Um, so let's just look at Mark chapter 15, verse 25. Mark 15, 25. If anyone has N, uh, NKJV, that would be helpful because you know that gives the actual literal uh, um, Greek translation. So uh, NKJ, because NIV, you know, tries to make, help us understand. And so it changes the wording to help us understand the actual meaning. But NKJV gives you the literal translation, which kind of, um, you know, helps us make the point. Uh, so Mark 15 verse 25 in NKJV, if anyone has it, please. Now it was the third hour and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above. Mark says over here that Jesus was crucified in the third hour. 
Now let's look at John chapter 19, verse 14. What does John say? When was Jesus crucified? John 19, 14. Again, uh, in, in the in, in KJV. John? John chapter 19, mm. verse 14. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. So according to John, the crucifixion takes place in the sixth hour. So it looks as if there is a contradiction. Mark is saying that the crucifixion happened in the third hour. John says that the crucifixion took place in the sixth hour. Now in this case, again, it's, an, it's a matter of ignorance, which makes people think that there is a contradiction. Mark is using the Jewish time system. For the Jewish people of that time, when did their day begin? Their day began when the sun goes down in the evening. I don't know what made them come up with that. But for them, their new day, the brand new day begins once the sun goes down. That is when day begins. And it goes on up uh, for the 24 hours until the next day when the sun sets again. So the day for them begins in the evening once the sun sets. And so for them, the Sabbath, you know, they're very strict about following the Sabbath, right? They begin celebrating the Sabbath when the sun goes down. That is when their Sabbath day begins. And they celebrate it throughout till the next day when the sun goes down again. So Mark is using the Jewish time system. And so he says, you know, based on the, on, on the way the day was divided into, uh, into time segments, he says in the third hour, which will be around your afternoon time, you know, around noon, so he says, in the third hour, according to the Jewish time system, in the third hour is when Jesus was crucified. John, on the other hand, uh, he uses the Roman time system. Because, you know, the Roman sundials of that time, they would divide the, uh, their sundial into 12 segments. Um, and uh, so he's using that measurement. And he says, in the sixth hour, which is also noon, the you know, afternoon time, is approximately when Jesus was crucified. So there's no contradiction over there. It's just that people who do not know what these verses mean would probably get the wrong impression that there is a contradiction. So when arguments are raised by people saying that the Bible is, has errors, that it is not correct in all of its facts, we just have to tell them, wait. Wait for the evidence to come out. Maybe the historical evidence has not yet been discovered. Maybe this, maybe science still has not fully understood certain things, which will be, we will get to know later. So wait, and you will see that whatever is mentioned in the Bible is factual and it is correct. Okay, so um, we hold that the Bible is infallible. It does not deceive in any way. It is completely trustworthy, and we hold that the Bible is inerrant. There are no errors in the original manuscript which was written down by the, uh, by the by the first you know inspired writer. Yes, there may be mistakes in the copies which were copied later, but in the original manuscript which was given through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, there were no errors when it comes to doctrine and there were definitely no errors when it comes to historical details and scientific facts and all the Bible passages which are mentioned. Now, um, last uh, week, we talked about how the Old Testament canon was formed and about how the New Testament canon was formed. Um, today, maybe we can look at how was this Old Testament canon transmitted through the ages and how was the New Testament canon transmitted through the ages? Because the criticism which is made is that you know, the, these uh, original scrolls were written so long ago and after that, who knows how many hundreds of copies were made through the ages. What are the chances that, you know, all kinds of corruptions and errors and defects, you know, what are the chances that all the errors did not creep into the copies? So they say that as time passed by, as hundreds of years went by, the original would have got lost because people would have, you know, made mistakes and then they would have made changes. And so they say that, um, the critics say, that maybe the original, uh, the originality of the original scrolls has not been maintained. That is one accusation which um, people tend to make. So maybe first we will look at the
transmission of the Old Testament through the ages. And we will see how effort was always made to preserve the accuracy of each sentence, of each phrase. Um, maybe we could start by talking about the Masoretic community. Now, um, around 500 AD, which is like basically around 500 years after the ascension of Jesus Christ, around that time, there was a group of uh, Jewish scholars known as the Maso Masoretes. Now, these people, uh, they, you know, they took it upon themselves to, to make as many handwritten copies as possible of the Old Testament scriptures so that the accuracy of the writings would be preserved. The Masoretes spent their entire lifetime, you know, um, forming new copies which are as accurate as possible so that no defects creep in in any way. Okay, so uh, the work of the Masoretes is respected right from that time, right from the time of 500 AD. Everyone knows that if a Masorete has written down a hand copy, he would have taken every effort to maintain the sanctity and the accuracy of every single line which is written down over there. Okay, so uh, in fact, we even today in one of the museums, we have one copy which was written by the Masoretes. This, in fact, was a copy which was written in um, around 935 AD. And uh, that copy, that 935 AD manuscript, exists even today. It's available in one of the uh, museums. Now, what some of the critics in the early 1900s, what some of the critics began to say is, how do you know this thing, this, this 935 uh, you know, AD manuscript, it was written 935 years after the ascension of Jesus. What are the chances that it has any resemblance to the actual scrolls from the Old Testament times? Because so much time has passed. So that was the criticism which was raised. And then, of course, we know, right? Um, the, all the critics were disproved once um, you know the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. So we would talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls and how these scrolls have helped prove to us that a lot of effort was taken to maintain the accuracy when making the copies. So yes, small spelling mistakes did happen. But when it comes to entire sentences and passages, they are all very, very accurate. So we'll kind of get into that after the break. Um, so maybe you can leave a little early and come back. Um, so at 11 o'clock, let's um, get into the uh, next portion of our uh, discussion. Thank you.